We're going to go to the book of 2 Chronicles in chapter number 4. 2 Chronicles in chapter number 4 tonight will be our text verse. If you got your Bibles, go to 2 Chronicles in chapter number 4. And uh, you will find our text tonight. Now, I've said before, I'll say it again. For those of you that are coming through your Bible this year, anybody that ever gets to the, especially the book of 1 Chronicles, not so much 2 Chronicles, I just come through there the other day, but about the first 10, 12 chapters or something like that of 1 Chronicles, that's some tough sledding, y'all. Uh, just put your head down and start pronouncing names and hope you don't talk in tongues or cuss. Amen. Uh, you do the best that you can. It's tough. And, uh, but it's all God's book. And it's all good stuff. And uh, Second Chronicles just come through there, like I say the other day. Really, that, that, that one makes a real fast pace. It does a real fast pace, whereas the books of First and Second Kings focus on both kingdoms, the kingdoms of Judah and Israel. You know, there was a split kingdom after the reign of Solomon. In the days of Rehoboam, the kingdoms split. And Judah had one kingdom, and Israel and the other tribes had another. Whereas First and Second Kings kind of highlights both kingdoms, Israel and Judah, we find that First and especially Second Chronicles simply highlights just the kingdoms of Judah, just the kings of Judah. And here we find in Second Chronicles chapter 4 something that you might have read through many, many times. And if you're not careful sometimes, you'll read through this stuff and think, well, there ain't nothing in that. What in the world could I grab a hold of in this preacher that could make practical application to my life? Uh, we understand Paul said that all these things, all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable. You're going to read a passage like I'm fixing to read in your hearing and you're going, when I read it, you're going to say, there ain't nothing profitable in that right there. How in the world can that be profitable to me as a child of God? But if you'll just hang with me here for a few minutes tonight, I promise I won't take long. If you'll just give me a few minutes, I believe we can find something very profitable and practical for the New Testament child of God living on this side of the cross in the church age of grace. So Solomon is constructing this temple to the glory of God. And the Bible's giving all of these specifications on different measurements and things of that nature. But he's also, the Bible's speaking of the artifacts that were put into this magnificent temple that Solomon made for the glory of God. We'll begin reading in verse number 2 of chapter 4. Chapter 4 and verse number 2. The Bible said also he made a molten sea of ten cubits from brim to brim, round in compass, and five cubits the height thereof. Let me, let me stop right there and say anytime you're reading your Bible and you read these cubits and you're unsure, because obviously we don't use this as a measurement term anymore. We use feet and inches and things of that nature. But they say a cubit was generally an average man's uh, uh, width from his top of his finger to his elbow, which is generally referred to as about 18 inches. So when you see a cubit in your Bible, it's about 18 inches. So if you ever want to measure something or whatever, just get your calculator out and start doing some dividing and multiplying. It's 18 inches is, is what you've got here. Anyways, so it said this thing was uh, 10 cubits brim to brim, 5 cubits in height, and it said a line of 30 cubits did compass it round about. In other words, the entire circumference was about 30 cubits around. And under it, now watch this, under it was the similitude of oxen, which did compass it round about, 10 in a cubit, compassing the sea round about. Two rows of oxen were cast when it was cast. It stood upon 12 oxen, three looking toward the north, Three looking toward the west, three looking toward the south, three looking toward the east. And the sea, this molten sea, was set above upon them. And all their hinder parts were inward. And the thickness of it was in handbreadth, and the brim of it like the work of the brim of a cup with flowers of lilies, and it received and held 3,000 baths. Somebody said a measurement of a bath, this is a liquid term, was about eight gallons. Uh, 3,000 uh, times 8 as far as gallons is what you'll come up with there. Anyways, uh, he made also 10 lavers and put 5 on the right hand, 5 on the left to wash in them. Such things as they offered for the burnt offering, they washed in them, but the sea for the priest, uh, but the sea was for the priest to wash in. Come down to verse 15. 
Verse 15 says this about what I've just got done reading to you. One sea and twelve oxen under it. Now what I've just read to you and you're hearing, you're sitting there thinking, dear God Almighty, that's some of the boringest reading that I've ever read in my life. I mean, you just read to us about this big, huge bowl, basically, this brazen, brass, molten bowl that Solomon had constructed that holds thousands and thousands of gallons of water, and this big, huge bowl sits on top of 12 brass oxen. Three looking this way, three ox looking that way, three ox looking that way, three ox looking that way. So there's this great big bowl that holds thousands of gallons of water, several ox are underneath it, and then there are... Ten spigots, five on one side that goes out to these lavers, these places to wash at. Five of them on the other side to wash at. And you think, how in the world, preacher, what in the world could you do with something like that? Well, I was reading through here one day, Brother Roger, and I got to reading about these oxen. It was the oxen that really started doing something in my heart. Do you know if you study oxen in the Bible, you'll find that oxen are a picture of two different things tonight. They're a picture of the pastor or the preacher, but they're also a picture of the people of God. You say now, preacher, I don't like being called an ox tonight. People have called me dumb as an ox, and people have called me strong maybe as an ox. But I don't like to be called an ox tonight. Well, you know what the Bible says about what I do, about my profession, about my calling? The Bible said this over in 1 Corinthians. We looked at it in our Sunday school class, and it says it in 1 Timothy. The Bible talks about the pastor, and it says to muzzle not the ox that treadeth out the corn. In other words, I I'm an old ox. God has me hooked up to the gospel plow and my job is just to tread out the corn. My job is to shell the corn to you. My job is to get hooked up under the yoke and I preach the word of God. I put my head down yoked up to the gospel plow and the Bible said uh, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God all them oxen terms. So not only am I a picture of an ox but you kind of are as well. You say where do you get that from? Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 29 and 30 Jesus said this I use this verse a lot preaching on the street it's a good one for street preaching but Jesus said in Matthew 11 28 to 30 come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Do you know in the Bible what had a yoke on it and what bore burdens? Oxen did. And the Bible said if you really want to live a life of joy, you just might as well get under the yoke of the Lord, get under the burden of the Lord, and walk with the Lord tonight. And so when I found out that oxen are a picture of not only myself, but they're a picture of you all under the yoke of God, son, then some things started happening in my heart when I began to look at this thing. These oxen are a picture of the Christian. And tonight, just for a few minutes, I'm going to highlight some truths about these oxen as it relates to you and I as the children of God and even me as the preacher. And tonight I'm going to preach on the occupation of the oxen. The occupation of the oxen. Brother, there ain't much good about you and me. We just, brother, look here, the Bible even likens us to sheep. We're, we're just scared, feeble, stupid, dumb individuals. But thank God we're yoked up to the master. Thank God if God's going to use something, he can use something as dumb as me and yoke me up to Jesus and do something with my life. And I want to show you what the job of you and I are as a picture of the oxen here. Let me say number one when we see the occupation of the oxen. Number one in our text Next, we see the duty of the oxen. We see the duty of the ox. Do you see what the duty of these 12 oxes were? You see what their job is? Look at their duty. The Bible said that this molten sea, look at verse number 4, this molten sea, it stood upon 12 oxen. You know what's in that sea? Water's in that sea. Do you know what that water's used for? According to your text, that water's used for cleansing. That water's used for washing. That water is used for purification. You know what the job of the child of God is? Let me back up and just say what my job is. You know what my job is tonight? My job is to hold up the water. My job is to hold up the water of the Word of God and hold up the water, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the water of life. 
And if any man thirst, let him come and take of the water of life freely. Them oxen were underneath the water. They held the water of purification up. You know what my job is every time I stand up here? I'm to hold up the water to you. I'm to hold up Jesus Christ and I'm to hold up the water of the Word of God tonight. But it ain't just my job. Brother, you're called to be a preacher of the gospel too. You might not call to be a pastor. You might not be called to be an evangelist or a missionary, but you are called to proclaim the words of God tonight. And do you know what your duty is as an ox of the Lord? Your duty is to hold up the water. Your duty is to take the water of the Word of God to your job and to your school and to your family and you're to hold that water up just as high as you can get it so that people who are thirsty, so that people who have tried everything this world has given out and it's left them dry and it's left them without peace and it's left them without hope, they can find somebody that's got a good cool drink of water in the desert of this world. You know what the Bible said in Proverbs 25? I believe it's Proverbs 25. It said, as cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Do y'all know what? I got the cold waters for thirsty souls tonight. I got the cool waters from a far country. I got the good news from the king. And my job as the ox is I am to lift up, hold up the water of life on my back tonight. That's our job. We not only see the duty of the oxen, but secondly, I want to show you the direction of the oxen. Did you notice the direction of these oxen? Look at what the Bible said. The direction of the oxen. Verse number 4. It said it stood upon 12 oxen. Look at their direction. Three looking toward the north. Three looking toward the west. Three looking toward the south. Three looking toward the east. You say, what's that got to do with anything? Well, I read over there in Mark chapter number 16, just before Jesus went back to heaven, he said this. Go ye into all the world. And preach the gospel to every creature. Do you see these people that are holding the water of the word up? These oxen, they're facing every direction. They're going north, south, east, and west. They're going every, they're facing every direction. That's our job tonight. Our job is not just to go right here where we live, but our job is to send the water out into the regions beyond. Now let me time out and just say this real fast. I don't say a lot about this, but I will tonight. You know why we support missionaries? Do you know why we send thousands? upon thousands of dollars every year and give it to people to go to places like the Philippines and the Mexico and to China and all over the world. You know why we do that? Because we want to get in on the Great Commission. I can't go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I can only be right here in Rowan County. But I'll tell you what I can do. I can support somebody else to go into the regions beyond and tell them about Jesus. I can support somebody else to go in my place and tell somebody some lost, dying sinner that ain't never heard the name of Jesus. I can support somebody to go in my stead tonight. Jesus said, you should be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, north, south, east, west. Included in this direction, not only is your duty to hold up the water, but look at your direction. We're to go into all the world, but then watch what the Bible said at the end of verse 4. And the sea was set above upon them... Watch it. And all their hinder parts were inward. You know, you know what that tells me? If there's three right here looking this way, and 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 all their back parts are inward, you know what that tells me? There ain't no backing up. There ain't no retreating. There ain't nowhere to go backwards in this thing. There's only one direction these things could go if they was to move. And that's forward tonight. Do you realize there is no retreat in the army of God? There is no backing up in the army of God tonight. As a matter of fact, when you read about the armor of God in Ephesians chapter number 6, you'll not read of one piece of that armor that covers your backside. There's not one piece of armor that covers your backside. There's a helmet of salvation. There's a breastplate of righteousness. There's loins girt about with truth. There's feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. There's a shield of faith. And there's a sword of the spirit. There ain't nothing for your backside. You know what that tells me? God never meant for his people to turn around and run in retreat. But he said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Our job is not to tuck tail and run. Our job is to go forward, forward, forward. Them 
old songs we used to sing said onward Christian soldiers marching out. I like that stuff. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Yes, soldiers of the cross. I like them kind of things. I like them battle songs like that. Them, let's charge y'all. I like what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He said, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Preach the word. Go forward, Timothy. Charge. Don't go backwards. It ain't time to back up. It ain't time to mollycoddle on what we believe. Good God, man. You talk about backing up in the day which we live. I mean, y'all, so-called America's pastor, Joel Osteen, um, America's pastor, just a, just a few years back when Larry King was still alive, that dude got on Larry King Live. You can pull it up and still watch it. I was watching it the night it happened. And that cat got on Larry King Live. This dude right here, his daddy was a Bible preacher. Joel Osteen's daddy was a Bible preacher that preached on hell and repentance. Boy, the, the apple sure did fall far from the tree. Or maybe I should say the nut fell far from the tree. And got on Larry King Live, and Larry King looked at him with millions of people watching and ability to be a witness for Jesus Christ. It's time to go forward now, son. It ain't time to back up and crawfish. Now's the time to go forward. And Larry King looked at him and said, Is Jesus Christ the only way to heaven? And you want to talk about crawfishing in the biggest way? I mean, brother, just trying to back out of this thing fast as he could. He said, Well, Larry... Larry, Larry, I, 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 I can't answer that. I, I can't say, Larry. He said, for me, Jesus is the only way, but, but I can't say for everybody. You can't say for everybody. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto Father but by. Well, you mean you can't say? I'm telling you definitely on the article of the Word of God, there ain't one way to heaven, and his name's Jesus Christ. And by repentance and faith through what he did on Calvary, you can go to heaven. Without that, you're going to bust hell wide open this evening. I'm telling you, I had, I, brother, I had a preaching streak come over me watching that. I was like, when, when Larry asked that question and I saw how terribly Joel answered it, I was like a kid in a classroom that the teacher would never call on. Ooh, 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 ooh. But they never did call on me, so I just had to tell them in my living room, man. I'm, I'm saying there ain't no backing up in this thing. All their hinder parts are inward. Child of God, our direction is forward, forward, forward. Never backwards tonight. Never backwards. We see the duty of the oxen, the direction of the oxen. Can I tell you something else about that, that duty of the oxen that I forgot to mention? Look at what else their duty is. Look at verse 5. Watch this sea that's on top of this oxen. It said the thickness of it, talking about this sea, was in hand breadth. I mean, you talk about thick. It's a, this thing is brass, molten, and it's a hand breadth thick. It said it, it, the thickness of it was a hand breadth, and the brim, this is the very top, the brim of this big thing. The brim of it was like the work of the brim of a cup. And watch what's on the brim at the very top. With flowers of lilies. The Bible said in Song of Solomon chapter 2 that Jesus Christ is not only the rose of Sharon, but he's the lily, he's the lily, he's the lily of the valleys. You see what's at the very top of this molten sea? The lilies are at the very top. You know what our job is as the oxen? We're to lift the lily up. We're to lift the lily up just as high as we can get. We're not to lift ourselves up. We're not to lift programs up and people up and performance up. You know what we're lifting up? Jesus Christ this evening. We're to lift the book up and lift the Lord Jesus Christ up this evening. Look, I, I, I thank God uh, to have programs and I thank God that we've got Sunday schools and I thank God we've got singing and I, I thank God for all that stuff. But brother, anytime, anytime that, I, that I talk to somebody and somebody asks me, what do you got for the kids or what do you got for this, what do you got? I tell you what we got main of, we got preaching. You say, what's that? We're going to lift Jesus up. We're going to get him just as high. And you know what I found out? That's good for the little ones just like it is for the big ones tonight. My job is to lift up Jesus. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Our duty tonight is to lift up the water and to lift up the lily. And then the direction tonight, we're to go into all the world. We're not to back up. 
Then look at the dispensing, the dispensing of the oxen. Not just the duty and the direction, but the dispensing. I'm coming down to the close. Watch the dispensing. Look how this water, I love this. Look how the water is dispensed. Y'all, I didn't get this out of some book. The Holy Ghost gave this to me. This is a blessing to my heart. I about shouted and run around the office, man. Look at what it said in chapter 4, verse number 6. He made also ten lavers. These lavers are like washing stations. He made also ten lavers, and he put five on the right hand, five on the left, to wash in them. You realize the common man can't get up into the water. It's too high. It said the priest could go up there, but just the average common man, Brother John, he couldn't get up into the, into the water on that sea. It's way too high. So how are we going to get the water down to him? The way we're going to get the water down to him is we, we're going to dispense it through five lavers over yonder and five lavers over here. Did you read that? There was ten of them, but it said there were five there and five here. Y'all, I talked about it this morning about how that number five has got a dual meaning in the Word of God. And one of the main meanings of that, number five, is what? Grace. You know, you know how God gets the water out to common everyday people like us? You know how God gives us the water of the washing to cleanse us? God gets it to us through the median of grace. God, God said there was five labors over here, five labors over here. When God gets ready to get the water to us, I can't get up there. I can't get into God's grace, get into God's water. So the way God gets it to me, he graciously gives it to me. By the good grace of God, I... I am what I am this evening. I didn't get, hey, I didn't get the mercy of God because I'm good. I got it because God's gracious. I don't got a Bible in my hand tonight because I'm worth it. I got it because God's gracious. I'm not saved tonight and clean because I deserved it. I'm saved and clean because God's a merciful God full of grace and he dispenses his water to us through the medium of his grace tonight. Ain't that a blessing? The occupation of us, the oxen, We see the duty of the oxen, the direction of the oxen, the dispensing through God's grace. And then lastly, I'll show you this and I'm done. We see the destruction of the oxen. The destruction of the oxen. These oxen end up getting destroyed. It's a real sad narrative. Take your Bibles and go to 2 Kings chapter 16. Uh, 2 Kings chapter number 16. And watch what your Bible says here. This is where they get destroyed at. 2 Kings 16. And verse number 17, 2 Kings 16, 17. There is a wicked king in this text, and his name is Ahaz. Ahaz is a godless, wicked, pagan king that is ruling over the people of the Lord at this time. Uh, He follows in the footsteps of so many wicked kings prior to him, and some that will even come after him. And watch what your Bible says about this godless pagan king Ahaz in verse 17 of chapter 16. 2 Kings 16, 17. And King Ahaz cut off the borders of the bases and removed the the laver from off them. Now watch what he does. And took down the sea from off the brazen oxen that were under it and put it upon a pavement of stones. See what he does? He takes the sea off the back of the oxen and says, we don't need them no more. Let's just put it down here and forget about the oxen. Now this is where where the oxen are more a picture of me maybe than it is y'all. Do you know what the modern climate of today is as the day gets darker and the day gets more wicked? Every time mankind gets more and more wicked, you know what they do? They want to get rid of old time ox preaching. They don't like that old plowing preaching. That preaching brother that plows them stumps up. An old ox that's got a hard forehead that'll butt heads with the people that's sitting in the pew and'll plow the sin up in their life and'll plow the wickedness up. They don't like that old ox preaching. We still, oh, we still want the water. We just don't want the ox giving it to us. Ain't that where we're living at today? And where we're living at? Oh, we still love Jesus, and we still like the Bible, and we still want to hear about Jesus and the Lord. But we want all that hollering and screaming and spitting and sweating and all that, getting down in my business and preaching in my face. I don't want all that. 
want it real nice and sweet. Just put it down here on the pavement and let us all just get it how we want. We don't want to go through the median of the ox to get it. Just give it, let, we'll all just get it how we want to. We can all interpret it the, only, the way we want to interpret it. That's not God's plan. God's plan is to yoke an ox up and dispense the water that way this evening. I'll give you one more verse about this ox stuff. You know, you want to know something? I'll readily admit to you. I'll readily admit to you. This kind of preaching, the kind of preaching that God lets me do, it's messy. Oxes are messy. The Bible says so. It's messy. But the job gets done with it. I'm going to show it to you. Look what's, this is my last verse and I'm out of here. We're done. We're out of here. Look at Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs 14. Talking about oxes. There's so many verses we could have run on just oxen tonight, but we didn't have time. Look at, look at Proverbs chapter number 14 tonight and verse number 4. Proverbs 14, 4. Watch what your Bible says right here. This kind of preaching's messy, but a lot of good gets done with it. You say, how do you know that? Because I've watched it get done in my life. Proverbs 14, verse 4. Where no oxen are, the crib's clean. That's, that's, where, that's where modern day lingo comes from. It comes out of a King James Bible. Come over to my crib, man. Want to see my crib? That's where, that's where it comes from. Where no oxen is, the crib's clean. That's where he stays at. That's where they keep the ox at in the stall. Where there ain't no ox is, the crib stays clean. If there ain't an ox in the crib, you know what that means? That means there ain't no junk on the floor. You know, there ain't, there ain't, you don't have to put straw in there. You don't have to keep the mud out. You don't have to keep the stuff shoveled out. It, it's clean. But look at the last part. But much increases by the strength of the ox. Yeah, you might keep the crib clean, but you ain't getting nothing done. And what good is it if you keep the crib clean if ain't nothing going on? And tonight, friend, what the world wants is they want a religion that takes the basin and the brazen sea off the backs of the old-time oxes and puts it down and just let us all do what we want to do. That ain't the way God designed things. And tonight, you are a child of God, and that means you have been yoked up. You an ox, too. And you know what your job is. Your job is to go out into this world and hold the water up and hold the lily up. And the direction is forward. It's not backwards. Your duty is to go forward, 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 onward, Christian soldier, marching as to war. That's our duty tonight. That's our job tonight. And God will give us grace to dispense the water to those that we come across. Tonight when you read your Bible... Don't just read that stuff and think, well, there ain't nothing in that for me. Man, there's something in that thing for you. There's more in that than you think there is for you. It's all through there. Find it. Grab it. Make it yours tonight. The occupation of the ox. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the truths of the Word of God. Lord, reading this just the other day helped me, encouraged me, blessed my soul. And God, I pray that it would help God's people too. Help us to just have the determination of an old ox. Help us, Lord, just to have the strength of an old ox. And God, help us, Lord, uh, when times get tough and the way gets hard, just to put our head down and keep on plowing, knowing that the Lord's there to help us. You're under the yoke with us. And God, you'll help bear our burdens with us. God, I pray that you'd bless the church now this week. Meet their needs. Watch over them. Protect them. Look after them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right.